When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. This I have Sean Hackett on here from Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. It's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the marketplace, man. So how you doing? I'm doing good, Casey. Uh, just continued to uh, you know get revved up for the Northern Hemisphere growing season, and you know we're just getting started, and there's always a lot of uh, at times excitement in various regions of the world as yeah. crops are developing and getting to their critical points of determining yield so that's yep. where, where we stand yep yeah there's a uh a fair amount of uh anticipation for this season coming up here it seems like out in my neck of the woods where we've had some significant drought you know we've got some decent rains we've got some crops coming in um amazing how fast it, it dries out but um you know we've had a whole week here yet i don't think we've had too many rains uh this week but leading up to this we've had quite a bit of rain so uh, a lot of things happening out there you start looking back east like you've talked about and there's there's some gaps there but um i think more importantly to hit on you know there's a lot of ukraine still in the news uh, you still you still see how much that affects the marketplace and every little thing that happens in the black sea region right now is is a big turner so we had the dam break that that uh the wheat market reacted uh pretty violently to the upward side and, you know they went up would you say almost 25 cents or something like that? Yeah. And then by the end of the day, they'd finished back down to where yeah. they started and lost a little bit of that back. And now you've got the the Black Sea um, grain talks to be held back again on Friday, which is whatever that is, 30 days earlier than it should have been held. So there's some a lot of, a lot of things up in the air there, Sean. So I guess as you're looking at that marketplace, what's your thoughts? The little boy who cried wolf. Yeah. I think we've heard so many times about all this stuff. I think the market says, you know, we, we, we want to see it. If it doesn't happen, we'll react. Uh, if we start uh, start seeing shipments, stop or react. But, you know, you've promised us, uh, you know, gold and, and, uh, and, and treasure at the end of the rainbow. And every time, you know, it doesn't happen. So we're just going to, you know, we're going to, we'll, when we see it, we'll believe it. I really think, you know, and yesterday was a great example of, of more of a few that were jumping and, and just said, whoa, whoa, what do we, what do we, no, back off. We're not buying in any anticipation right now because it's not, you know, for, for almost a year, it's been the wrong trade. Right. And so I think until you see the whites of the eyes of a change in policy uh, where restrictions are back in place and the Russian cash wheat price begins to respond to the upside, which has been holding everything down, that's when the market's going to respond more permanently. I, you know, I believe sooner or later, you know, before too long, that is going to happen, Casey. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, I mean, just looking at everything and looking at where the supplies are, I, I think that's inevitable. But, you know, could be this month, could be August. So, you know, in the world of futures and options, you know, two months is an eternity in terms of time. So everyone is trying to micromanage all this stuff. But for now, I just don't see Russia-Ukraine news and geopolitics driving the market up for any material period of time. The market is just just totally gun shy. And yesterday was a class example. Do not chase um, these stories and these um, temporary uh, events. Trade something that's actually real, you know, that in terms of 
actual supply being constrained or actual cash prices in Russia showing move to the upside. Absent those two things, everything else is just a bunch of noise. Although the humanitarian consequences are awful, we're trying to deal with what yeah. the markets are going to do here. Yep. So. Yep. Yep. Good stuff. All right. So I can't get my head wrapped around this one. We're supposed to be in recession. There's all this uh, talk about the exploding amount of credit card debt and and the average credit card debt in the in the uh, U.S. household, but yet wholesale beef prices just continue to just go through the roof. Um, I guess what what's your what's what's some of the driving factors there, Sean? I mean, this seems like to me that there's a there's a uh, the fundamentals don't add up, I guess, but maybe I'm obviously completely wrong here. So markets from time to time can get into a short term supply squeeze crunch. It seems to me many of the buyers, whether they're supermarket chains or whether they're the packers, you know, kept hearing all this recession talk, kept hearing about, you know, the demand for in the economy uh, falling, which it has, by the way, in a lot of different areas yeah. and anticipating that demand for beef would back off. And I just think they got to the moment of truth of the grilling season and they didn't see it and they underbought, they underprepared. And now there's a mad dash to fill orders that they already committed to for the grilling season that they have to commit, even if it means losing money doing it. I mean, if you looked at the earnings of JBS and Tyson foods during the, the that they just came out uh, in the last month, in the last quarter, both companies had the worst quarter in their corporation's history because they're not making money right now. Um, and so, so, so it just seems to me somebody or somebody's with an S got caught being under owned or under supplied in a, in the peak U S demand part of the season. And is now has to go in and chase the market higher. And, you know, the sellers in the driver's seat, you know, the sellers do if they're think they have the advantage you know, mm -hmm. one for you, and now we're higher. One for you, and now we're, you know, and that, that's the game, and that's that's what's called the parabola, right? The straight mm -hmm. up move that we see in markets from time. We're seeing the straight up move. What goes up almost inevitably comes back down because the grilling season ends. All these commitments are met, and the Packers aren't going to continue to bring animals through and lose money. They're going to cut their their uh, capacity utilizations back they're gonna say okay no we're not gonna run three shifts anymore we're gonna run two you know they're just they're gonna cut back because they're not gonna keep maximizing their losses by every by, by losing money on every animal they bring through the system so that's what i think is going on here i think it's sort of demand is real that it has been sticky but i think that this push in demand isn't like a real explosion demand it's somebody or somebody's getting caught and having to drive the cash market higher to fill orders that they you know, had thought, you know, they didn't need to cover because they expected demand to be weaker. Now, now we can argue, you know, why is demand not falling more than it one would have thought? You know, I, I don't, I don't have an answer for you on that one. You know, that that's something that we can look back and try to figure out how beef demand uh, stood up so well at a time that normally it does not hold up, hold up so well. Yeah. But if you look at the pork cutout price, it's done a V a V bottom here and it's now just going straight up. Something has happened here. Finally, you know, we talked about how, how long can we have the pork cut out here and the beef cut out, you know, here, you know, and it looks like we might be getting a rotation. I mean, the, the, the beef cut up price has just gone parabolic here in the last uh, week. And it seems like there's been a, a big time demand shift all of a sudden out of nowhere. And, you know, I have to believe that, you know, a, a lot of this demand coming for pork is buying less beef and it may not show up today with a panicky packer and a panicky uh, uh, supermarket uh, company you know, under owned in the, in the physical, but it probably shows up, you know, J July, August when we come off peak. So these are subtle signs that you look for um, to kind of determine when we might be at least at some kind of an exhaustion point. I would uh, highlight that in the feeder cattle market specifically, we're trading near a 50 year high premium of the feeder cattle price to the 200 day moving average. So, so all you do is you take the 200 day moving average Casey and you measure the deviation up or down. And 
the more it trades at a premium, the more overextended the market is to the upside and the more vulnerable it is to a reversion back down. And so if you look at a 50 year chart of feeder cow prices, where this premium deviation is right now, you know, give or take, th these have been very, very, um, uh, you know, important signs of an impending short-term top. So, you know, doesn't mean it has to do it today. Maybe we can extend the deviation further. There's nothing that says it can't do something more than it did. But 50 years of data is a pretty good indication that we're getting into some very, very rare territory. I call it the ether part of the zone where you have to be just very, very careful about a sudden unexpected reversion down. And, you know, if I'm in the business of selling cattle, I would keep feeding the market. You know, look, you can't predict when the parabolic move is going to end, but you just keep feeding it every day. Feed it, feed it. Because the minute, the minute it turns back down and it's limit down, trying to sell in a down limit down market is almost impossible. You have to keep selling and averaging on the way up so that when the crash comes, you've taken care of business, you've locked in good prices, and you don't have to chase the market down because you got caught up in the bullish fever. That has been what we've learned in our 35 years of looking at the cattle market that in these kinds of situations, uh, that's the best strategy for a producer to be taking right now. Forget trying to pick the top, just keep feeding the parabola right now. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. So we don't talk about this very much, but I read an article in it and it made me, uh, made me think about the last time we talked about it. So um, probably a year ago, six months ago, something like that, we had a pretty good conversation about avian flu and what that would done to a few things. We talked about egg prices and what that looked like. Cause we were, I was talking about my wife went to the grocery store and bought grocery or bought eggs. And that was something like nine bucks a dozen. And the organic eggs were like $5 a dozen. <clears throat> and that has seen a, uh, the article I read has talked about the incredible reversal that egg prices have had where you're looking at. Now you're looking at, you know, almost, almost to a loss in some in some cases that eggs are being produced. So I guess looking at that that poultry market, Sean, what what are your thoughts there and what do you see happening? We just had a discussion what's going on in cattle. That's exactly what happened in eggs. Parabola, mm -hmm. straight up shot, panic, people chasing the market. You know, we see this pattern repeatedly, Casey, time and time again. And it always ends the same way. There's always a great story. It's always different this time. It's always, you know, this, this story has, you know, different than the last one. It's going to keep on going. It's never going to end. It always does. You can't, you know, there is a limit to what people can pay, period. I mean, we have to, what's, I think there's a, there's a number I'm trying to remember that, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that these people necessarily are managing their lives correctly, but. I think there's something like half the people that are making $250,000 in this country um, are living week to week in, in, in their cost structure and how they've structured themselves. 250,000 are considered to be your elite top five percentile of the country if you're making 250,000, that half of those people in this country living week to week with their overall cost structure. Now you could argue they've overblown, they've bought too many cars, they have a house they can't afford. It doesn't matter, right? That's the situation. Right. Those people do not have massive capacity to incur massive increases in their expenses when they're right on the edge. So when something like eggs or beef or you know dairy you know goes to the roof, they are going to find a way to cut back and use and use less or or find ways to use alternative proteins. And so eggs, fertilizer is another classic parabola that we had last year everybody got caught up and it. it's never going to come back down we have a permanent shortage russia's not exporting china's not exporting everybody you know, was convincing farmers they needed to lock in high expensive uh, fertilizer we were not by the way uh we only made recommendations to start buying fertilizer this spring um and crash and burn you know just complete crash and burn you have to get used to the market psychology the market's going to try to get you to do the worst thing possible most of the time. It wants you to get in such an emotional state that you're gonna buy the top and sell the bottom. That's what the cash market and the futures market is trying to get everybody to do is the, absolutely the wrong thing at the wrong time. That's why we talk about sentiment. That's why we talk about groupthink. Um, that's why we talk about when everyone's on one side of the boat, it tends to, you know, 
you really have to get into this psychological profile of markets and get away from the madness of crowds and of media hype and stay focused on your bottom line as a producer, your bottom line as an end user, and the history of how commodity markets tend to price and what characteristics to look for at bottoms and tops. Nothing's perfect. Doesn't mean you ever get it perfectly right, but you know, if it, you don't have to get it perfectly right, you just need to get it generally right. And I think if you, as a producer, as an end user, as a trader, as a hedger, focus on those kinds of psychological, historical constructs of price um, and sentiment, I think you will do yourself a world of good of improving how much money you bring home on the farm. Eggs, uh, uh, fertilizer, and now cattle um, are. You know, I, I, I'm pretty confident a few months from now, we're going to be talking about the cattle market having come down substantially for no apparent reason. Everyone is shocked. And now what are producers are supposed to do? And I, my hope is in the discussion we're having today is that they know exactly what they need to do. <laughs> they need to be okay. feeding the parabola. So right on. Okay. Um, a few other things I think we can talk about next time, though, but I feel like it's probably a good place to stop right there, Sean. If folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing at Hacka Financial. What's the best way to do that? Well, we have our Twitter page at Faradex11. Uh, we have our website, Hackett, H A C K E T T, advisors.com. We have our LinkedIn page. From time to time, we make comments. From time to time, we post some interviews that we've done with you and others about our weather cycles, capital flow cycles sentiment work and how we make our forecasts and how we you know try to provide you know advice to our customers and our in agriculture to you know bring more money home on the farm and so hopefully you know those uh avenues people can go to to um you know get more familiar with what we're doing here right on okay sean i appreciate you being on the podcast man always a blast casey we'll look forward to doing it again that's awesome I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast and check out the video version over on the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. Check that out there. Go to Moving Iron LLC for everything Moving Iron related. If you're interested in going to the Moving Iron Summit, come up here in Nashville, Tennessee, September 11th through the 13th. Uh, you can get all the information there. Or you can send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast and Moving Iron and I'll be happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Um, if you're interested in going to the Moving Iron Summit, Make sure you're one of the first 150 people to sign up and you'll get that uh, $50 discount from the people over at Axon on your registration fee. Um, they also have a, a great giveaway. They're giving away a, a Stanley steel cup, whatever they call those things. Uh, if you want one of those, um, send them an email at marketing at axontire.com. They get that over to you. So I'm one hell of a pitch man, Sean. I don't know if you knew that or not. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking for You know what, Casey? You know, Sold! There you go. <laughs> There you go. If you're looking looking for a pitch, man, Sean, just give me a shout. I'll take care of you. So <clears throat> with that. 25, 5, 20, 25, sold. <laughs> right on, man. All right. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour, Sean Hackett. Let's move some iron, folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century.